When Peter does this, it's so impactful, Jesus responds to Peter, I'm, I'm going to give you the keys to the king. Jonathan sent me a video today of a mutual friend of ours preaching. He said, listen to this. And he was preaching on Matthew chapter 16. So, that didn't hinder me. That encouraged me to preach on Matthew chapter 16. Amen. And I'll start to read. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Let me pause there and tell you the phrase, the sign of Jonah was used by Jesus as a Typological metaphor for his future crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Jesus answered with this expression when he asked by the when asked by the Pharisees for miraculous proof that he was indeed the Messiah. And the Pharisees remained unconvinced Jesus claimed about who he was. They were sign seekers. And Jesus says you're not going to receive any other sign except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be. And here they're testing the Lord in the 16th chapter. If you back up to the 12th chapter, Jesus had just... Uh, cast the, the demon out of a man who was blind and mute. He heals the man, and then the man could talk and he could see, and they want something else. They wanted more compelling evidence than to see him heal someone from blindness and deafness. Why? Wouldn't that be enough proof is what I think. Uh, that sure would have done it for me. But their request doesn't come from faith. It came because they doubted him. They didn't believe in him. A lot of times people will confide in me and say things and tell me who they're trying to witness to and maybe looking for, you know, some way to reach someone who won't listen. But I'm going to have to just be blunt with you tonight. There's some people that are just not going to listen. Okay? And they're always going to be seeking something that's already been proven. And they live by their own pre preconceived ideas. And they live by... Uh, what their mama said or their daddy said or their grandma said or whatever denomination they're in said and by the way they're just not going to change their mind if there's going to be any mind changing God will do it the Pharisees that have approached Jesus in this they're full of themselves most all of us would know what that means but if you look at the Pharisees, they're full of tradition. They're full of fables. They're full of rituals. Uh, they're full of acts that in their actions, 
They tried to demonstrate that they were more holy than everyone else. In fact, they were proclaiming that they were the children of Abraham, but in fact, they hated Jesus. And Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 24, he calls them blind guides. Then he said this, he, he used this, listen to this colorful speech. He said, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. Then he says, verse 25, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup cup and the dish and then the outside also will be clean woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees you hypocrites you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean in the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and witness wickedness. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous and you say if we had lived in the days of our ancestors we would not have taken part with them shedding of the blood of the prophets so you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You Snakes, you brood of vipers, will you escape being condemned to hell? Pretty tough preaching, isn't it? Calling a lot of names from the bullpen is what he's doing. So we see Jesus, he's contending with religious actors. Religious actors. Back to Matthew 16. I've got to stay on Matthew 16, verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. And be careful, Jesus said to them, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they discussed this among themselves and said, it is, it is, it is, it is because we didn't bring any bread. He's upset that, that we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, verse 8, Jesus asked and says, you of little faith, why are you talking about, uh, what are you talking about among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The yeast that he's warning them of is false teaching. I wonder how much teaching is being taught that is false today. This is a big point. Jesus has a huge problem with people that are teaching false things, false doctrines. Teaching a lie and people are believing the lie. Verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Verse 19, and I will give you what? Keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. To bind or to be bound is a punishment or a 
or a curse for some sin that is not forgiven. And to lose is to be forgiven or freed from punishment. Therefore, if you want to bind the devil, you will need to know what the Bible says about what you're dealing with and how to live in the truth and the revelation of it. A lot of people say, well, I'm binding the devil. Well, that's really not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is invoking the word of God upon whatever your situation is. We got a lot of people doing a lot of things and they don't have any idea what they're doing. Amen. Just as if you want to be loose for some, from something, if you're bound in an addiction and you want to be loose from it, you need to have scripture to know what Jesus is saying about what your addiction is. Whatever it is, you're strong. maybe you're carrying something. You say, well, why am I, how do I get rid of this? Well, you need to invoke the scriptures. Uh, Kenneth Hagin used to say, place a demand on the Word of God. But if you don't have any of the Word of God in you, how do you recall that to know how to place a demand on it? That's what we're doing here tonight. I'm helping you. If you want to be healed, well, you have to strengthen your faith. How do you do that? Brother Steve, will you pray for me? Absolutely. At the same time, you need to understand when Jesus would approach people with, that were sick, much of the time he would ask them about their faith. Sometimes he would say other things like, oh, ye of little faith. So if I need something from God, I need to learn how the word applies to whatever it is that I'm going through or whatever it is that I need. And that's the binding and the loosing that he talked about. Frankly, you have to become a word person. If you want to have any authority in the kingdom of God and know how to navigate your life as a Christian, you will have to become a word person. You'll have to love this more than you love the world. You'll have to love this more than you love going to the doctor. you have to love this more than you take my advice from me. Because this is the way. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. You have to become a word person. You can scream at the devil if you want to. But you're going to have to do what Jesus did when the devil came to him. And he, what did he do? He responded with the word. And then you can simply say, leave. <laughs> resist the devil. Everybody say, resist the devil. Resist. How do you resist the devil? How do you resist the devil? You resist the devil by living in obedience to the word of God. Uh, that sounds kind of, sounds... That's a vague statement for a deep truth. Now, if you notice in this reading what I really wanted to get to tonight, Jesus, he says, I'm going to, to Peter, he says, I'm going to, Peter, because of this revelation of who I am, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. You got your keys with you? I mean, you got your keys. Who doesn't carry their keys with them? You got your keys? Think on that tonight. He says, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. James 4, verse 1. Let me build a little something here. Listen to what James said. If you haven't read the book of James in the last month, I want you to go home. But the book of James is only five chapters long. Go home and read it three times. Come back Sunday morning and tell me something you, that you didn't know. Okay? James chapter 4 verse 1 says, listen to this. It's a question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. 
You covet, you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, listen, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Listen here. He uses a sexual connotation and he says you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, that means hostility against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he is jealous, that he jealously longs for the spirit he's called to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. That is why the scripture said God opposes the proud. Listen, but shows favor to the humble. Verse 7. Submit yourselves to God. How do I resist the devil? Submit yourselves to God. Yield yourself to God. Yield yourself to the word. I mean, carry that word everywhere you go. Talk about it when you sit down, when you get up, when you text it. Talk about it. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And what does the devil? The devil hates the word. The devil is disarmed in the life of a believer that is armed with the word. Verse 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. God is waiting on you to move first. Okay? What will God do? Well, you move first. Come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, your sinners. Stop sinning. Clean up your life. Purify your heart. If you've got a grudge or you're holding something, let it go. You double-minded. That's a double-minded man. He teaches in verse 1, in chapter 1, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And let not that man think that he's going to receive anything from God. Huh? That's James. If you have no word in you, you have no resistance. And you have to become spiritually strong to be immune to the attacks of the devil. I didn't say you would never hurt, you would never bleed, you would never have a problem if you became a full 100% living for God authorized Christian. But I'm going to tell you what, the devil's going to have a tough time getting you down. Because what you're going to do, you're going to get so full of God and so full of his word. You're going to count it all joy when you fall into temptation and trials. Knowing that the trying of your faith is working patience. It's wow. teaching you how to persevere. I'm not here because I feel good. I'm here because I know God is good. And that if I'll stay with God, he'll see me through whatever I go through. And I am resolved in that. Come on. If you have no resistance, you have to become spiritual. You have to become spirit. Uh, focus on spiritual things. Everybody say spiritual things. I met with an attorney the other day and just some, asking some questions. I, so I know my rights and I know the law about my own personal doings and I we you know I asked some questions and uh, if I don't ask the attorney questions I don't know I don't know the law like the attorney knows the question the the questions to ask uh, I don't know the law like like the attorney did so I go to the I go to someone who knows and I ask how do how does the law affect me in this way my physical, how I'm governing my personal affairs. I want to know what the law says about it. What I should do or what I shouldn't do. Listen, if you don't know the Bible, you don't know what you're supposed to do. And most likely, most Christians are living way below their privilege because they never took the time for study and insight or show up on Wednesday night where somebody can yell in your ear. So they go through life full of chaos and confusion. All right. Why do I have the problems I have? Well, some of the problems you have because you won't apply yourself. Same reason some of us had trouble in school. We wouldn't listen and apply ourselves. Amen. All right, three of us. You may 
be a great singer. You may be extremely talented. You may be good looking. You may be pretty. You may have received the Holy Ghost as a child. You may have been baptized three ways. Frontwards, backwards, sideways. But if you don't know the word of God, you're not going to make it with, with, without falling a lot. Huh? The word of God. Do you know what this is? This is God's thoughts written down. This. You want to know what God thinks about your situation? He wrote it down. But you're going to have to. He's requiring something of us. He sent you a gift. He sent you a pastor. To yell in your ear. To explain it to you. To pray for you. But you've got to eat it. Smells like fresh bread in here, doesn't it, spiritually? If you're going to be in a specific occupation, we say you have to have that field of study. Study. Study it. Imitate it. Imitate it. Modeling. Believing. Every once in a while, let me think of Every once in a while, uh, in the evenings, my kids, sometimes Tom, sometimes Kristen, load their kids up on the side of the side, a golf cart or whatever, right over to my house, and they're right around a circle around my house waiting for me to come out. Last night, Tom had all his kids on the golf cart and riding around the house looking for Papa. Well, I saw him coming around and they pulled up. And Tommy had on these gloves. It was some kind of costume. And there's these guys, these thirsty scientists, this is a cartoon called the Kratz. I'm sorry? Wild Kratz. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, but I don't. <laughs> Wild Kratz. And these two guys, and they, Tommy's got these gloves on and he's got this vest. And I said, Tommy, you a Power Ranger? <laughs> I don't know what Power Ranger is. Tom said, Dad, that's the 90s. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Tommy's like, no, uh, wild crabs. <laughs> he, in his mind, has become, and he is whoever this wild crab is, the scientist that, that evidently has gloves with power in them. Is that right? And some kind of chest, uh, vest on his chest. And he is who he's. He has become this person. And he is modeling that. You know what we're supposed to do? We are, we are supposed to. We call ourselves Christians because we're supposed to be modeling what we have watched and what we have heard and what we have, con we have professed that we are Christians. Well, we got the gloves and we got the vest, but the question is, where's the power? Okay. People are putting stickers on their car. They wear necklaces. Now they're getting tattoos with crosses on them. I wondered last night, don't get offended too much. I don't care, maybe a little bit. Why don't we put a cross right in their forehead? And all that doesn't make sense to Brother Steve. Listen, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to know something about him. He's asking Peter, who do they say that I am? 
And he says, Peter says, you're the Christ. Yeah. He said, you're the Messiah. You're the one this religious system is looking for. Jesus responds upon this rock. Peter, his name was Simon, and now he says Peter, which means little rock. Upon this revelation, Jesus Christ, Christ means anointed. He says, my father revealed this to you. And he says to Peter, he says, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now this doesn't, see, this has rolled off of our tongues for years, but I want to bring a little light to you. The statement that Peter just made to Jesus that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, the Jews would kill you for that. Okay? Now, it, it seems hard for us to grasp because for years we've been telling people we're Christians. But in this age, in this back 2,000 years ago, if you, if you said that, it, you were, your life was in jeopardy. And this is, a, this is a major statement that he's making. There's a lot to me and you. We've been here our whole life. But when Peter made it, it was a big deal. Paul wrote this, give you an idea how big, Romans 10, he said, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire to God is that Israel would be saved, for I can testify about them, their zeal is for God, but their zeal is not based, based upon knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the accumulation of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does those things will live by them. But the righteousness which is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend to the deep, that is bring Christ from the dead. But what does it say? Here's what it says. The word is near you. The word is where? It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning, concerning faith that we proclaim. That if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You know what? That's not a simple line in a creed and a denomination. That's not what that is. This letter is written to the Christian church in Rome. And they were being, they were being uh, put on poles. They were being burned alive. They were being crucified. Their children are watching their children being fed the lions. Because if they confessed that Jesus was Lord, they lost their lives. Okay? This wasn't one of those things just say Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. That, that's, not, well, that's not the context. Look, verse 10, for it's with your heart you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, the same as Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we put this scripture in context and to proclaim Christ in Rome 2,000 years ago, it was a death. It was a death statement. It was public, listen, it was public rejection of Roman law. Why? Because people worship Caesar. They worship the gods of mythology. They had many gods. 
And to stand up and say, I worship Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. It meant death. Okay. How many Christians would be willing to live under the oppression and the penalty of death? How many Christians would there be today that would live under the oppression and penalty of death if you knew you went to town and someone asked you who or what you believed in and if you said Jesus, you died. It makes proclaiming Christ in a whole different setting. When Peter does this, it's so impactful, Jesus responds, Peter, I'm, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. How many got your keys? I see. I see some keys. Anybody got your keys? What, what are keys? Huh? What are the keys? Keys. <clears throat> different keys. There's a lot of different keys. Derek Prince says there's over 70 keys. In the kingdom of God. One of the keys to the kingdom of God is this. It's that you and I are of like mind and like faith. And that we operate in unity. Uh, one of the six things, yea, seven God hates is discord among the brethren. You know? You know that? God hates it. See in Acts 2. The day of Pentecost fully come, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, they're all in one place. They're in one accord in one place. And what happens? Ten days they've been praying. They're singing. I'm using my imagination. They're there. They won't leave. And they're anticipating. Why? Because Jesus said, you go and tarry and you wait. And they're all in agreement with that. And after ten days, we won't wait an hour and a half. But they waited. And they're all in agreement. And the Holy Spirit falls on them. Yeah. Psalm 133. One of my favorite scriptures. Peter writes this. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head to round down, down the beard. Even Aaron's beard went to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon, as the dew descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands a blessing forevermore. In unity, the blessings of God are poured out. In disharmony and discord and, and confusion. There's no blessing in that. The blessing is there when we agree. We pull together. Thank you, Jesus. Unity is very, very important. So much that Jesus said, we're two or three gathered in my name. There I would be. Unity and agreement. Pull in the same way. Praying in agreement. Praying in agreement. You want another key? Pray in agreement. Pray with me about this. Pray with me about this. Most people just make their own decisions, blow and go now. I love it when somebody says, hey, would you pray with me about this? I call Brother Marvin. It's been maybe a year or so ago and uh, dealing with the missionary. You remember Brother Marvin? I called you and I said, hey, uh, they're needing, they're needing a certain amount of money. And I said, I called Brother Marvin and said, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've been asked to do. And this is what we need to do something. And I need to know a number. I'm real clear. I said, I need to know how much of a check to write this missionary. And I want you to agree with me. I'm going to call you tomorrow by 2 o'clock. Listen to me. I told him, I said, I'm going to call you tomorrow by 2 o'clock. And I'm going to ask you for an answer. And I'm not, I didn't tell him what I was thinking. I asked him to pray about it. I called him back before 2 o'clock the next day. And I said, Brother Marvin, how much? He said, 5000 I said, that's what I was thinking. So we wrote him a check for 5000 Prayer is, listen, prayer is a key. Agreement is a key. Agree in prayer. 
It's powerful. Amen. Want another key? Love is the key. Love is the key to the kingdom of God. Huh? It's not hard for me to love Kelly. Because Kelly loves me. Man, Kelly, she wants the best for me. I can't tell her I need a cabin or a tractor or she'll go by. She don't care. If I want it, she wants it. What? I talked about love. It's easy to love somebody like that. Have you ever tried to love somebody that hated you? Oh, oh, oh. wait, Brother Steve. Is, is that Christianity? Exactly what it is. Some of you, my brother, he calls me every day. He loves me. But there's some people I don't want calling me. Amen. Why? Because they don't love me. Love is a key. Repentance is a key. All right. If you want forgiveness, the first thing you've got to do is repent. People say, well, I forgave them. Did they come and ask for it or are you just releasing them? Because they can't be restored until they ask and they repent. God won't forgive you of your sins till you repent. Don't be confused in this. Well, I'm just going to let it slide. Well, God's not letting it slide. Peter asked the Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? That seems a lot in a day. John, don't you transgress against me seven times in a day or you're going to get an earful. I was like, amen. amen. Peter says, my brother trespassed against me seven times. Seven times? Should I forgive him seven times? He said, no. Seven times 70. What's he doing? He said, look, Peter, there's no limit when people come and ask to be forgiven. You forgive them. Somehow the church world has gotten to this point that you don't have to, have to ask and be repent and repent of the sin. And it's, 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 it's false, it's false doctrine. Right. It's false doctrine. Faith is the key. Faith is the key to the kingdom. You want something out of God? You're going to have to, you're going to, you want to, you want something loose or something bound? Huh? You're going to have to know how to invoke the word of God on it. Faithfulness is the key. A man must be found faithful. Doesn't seem like much to me. Well, it seems like a lot to God. Singing is the key. You notice anything tonight? We start to sing. We start to sing. Man, we warm this up thing up for 45 minutes. Or why? Because what that does, that conditions you to receive the word. We come in here, we're all cold, and we've been sweating. Well, we're cold now. We've been sweating most of the day. And a lot of us has had our mind on the world, and we've been thinking about our job and everything but God. So we come in here, and what do we do? We start to sing about the Lord and what He's done, how good He is, and praise God. Then we start to pray, and we sing a little more. You know what's happening? We're tilling the ground. We're getting the soil broken up. Because the seed's coming forth, and I'm going to sow some seed. The more you go out there, and you look at it, there won't be nothing there. You go out through the next day, you look, ain't nothing there. But about three weeks from now, you go up there, and you'll see a little spring coming up in your life. Because you got a memory verse. And I said, hey, tell me what your go-to memory verse is. And you say, Jesus well. I say, what does that mean? He was full of compassion. kingdom, Peter. When Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Get your pencil out and write this down. No one had ever said that before. <laughs> uh, write that down. Write it. I, I never heard anybody say this till today. I, got to, I thought, nowhere in the scripture had opened to, acknowledged him publicly that you're the Christ. The angels they said what he was, who he was. But here you've got someone who knows who he is. To 
let's write this down. To confess that he is the son of God is sacrilege to the Jews. And they will hate. They will hate to the point that they kill Jesus in it. Hmm? They're going to kill Jesus over this. Keys to the kingdom. One of the keys to the kingdom is loving your neighbors yourself. Man, I've known this stuff my whole life. It's, a little, it's one thing to hear it. It's one thing to read it. But to do it. Keys. So when you send me keys, I've run out of time. But listen, Jesus says, Peter will give you the keys to the kingdom and the gates of hell shall not prevail, make advances against the proclamation of who I am. Okay? The proclamation of who I am. Stand with me, please. I hope you got something out of this. Keys. Keys. Living a righteous life. I got to thinking about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. Huh? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. Hallelujah. 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 If you want to be full of faith, get around somebody that's full of faith. If you want to be, if you want to have the power of God in your life, get around and watch and listen to somebody with the power of God in their life. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. When we, Kelly, when we first got married, oh, Kelly, boy, she was in love with me. Listen to me. We'd be in the store and I'd stop and she'd bump into me. I'm so like, what are you doing? She said, I just want to be near you. I just want to be near you. I just want to be near you. She hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. Listen to me. She hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. She told me she had it. She did. I knew it. <laughs> huh? Two years. Two years. Two years. Two years. Two years. We're driving down the road one day. She looked over and she said, Steve, you got something I don't have. She started seeking. She wrote a book about it. Get a free book back there. She wrote a book. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Come on up here. I'll be real short. No, you're, you just take your time. You Come here. Come up here. There you go. So he said something about your favorite verse, and I've, I've missed a few services. So, uh, Sister Sarah, could you put up? Uh, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, starting in verse 14. 1 Thessalonians, King James Version, that's not what my heart knows. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. And this is a list of some of the keys. We learned this when I was a little girl, probably five or six years old. Warn them that are unruly. That's one. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Next verse. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Next verse. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Next verse. Quench not the spirit. Dis 
despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And here's what comes to you if you hang on to those keys. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means completely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keys to the kingdom. Bow your head with us tonight, we pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. You've been so gracious to us in long suffering. We know tonight that you are not willing that any perish, but that all would come to repentance. God, I pray that we hear the word, we receive it, we take it home, and when we lay on the bed tonight, we meditate on what we hear. And God, way down in the recesses of who we are, I pray that every one of us look at you and say, I have to be more like Jesus, and I'm going to have to change. Transform. Be born again. Father, I pray, I thank you for these people, God. I ask you your blessings on them and that you would bring us back at the appointed time. We pray this in the lovely name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.